Are you looking for the scoop on your favorite comedian? You want to hear details about the guy that's made you laugh in your life? This is Funny Like a Clown Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Worth, and we review comedians. We have comedian guests. It's all about comedy here, folks, because laughter is the best medicine. April 27th, 2021. This is episode 106. Uh, we're going way, 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 way back. Okay, now, how far back? We're going back to the name of Bob Hope, okay? And I don't care how far back you go, you're going to remember this guy because he had one long-ass career, man. As always, today's episode is brought to you by G Vegas Buffalo Sauce for the spicy, sweet, savory taste of game time. There's only one G Vegas available at www.gvegas.webs.com. Go get yourself some hot and spicy buffalo sauce. Get ready for game time. I'm quite certain Bob Hope, uh, buffalo sauce probably wasn't a big thing in his time, but, uh, had it been, I'm quite certain he would have enjoyed it because he seems like a buffalo sauce kind of guy. Uh, man, what can you say about this guy? Leslie Towns Bob Hope, all right? I didn't know he, did you know his name was Leslie? Huh? Y'all thought it was Bob. No, it was Leslie Towns Bob Hope. Uh, changed it to Bob later on. Uh, let's see. Uh, he was a vaudevillain actor, a uh, singer, dancer. He was an athlete. He was an author. This guy just did it all. Why did he do it all? Because he had a career that spanned almost 80 freaking years, man. And you do anything for 80 years. If you just lived 80 years old, you've accomplished something big. Never mind being in the same field of comedy for 80 years. That's a freaking career right there, man. I mean, what haven't you done in 80 years on this planet if you're doing the same thing? Over 70 short films and features, uh, 54 with him as the star, uh, did a series of seven uh, road musical comedies with uh, Bing Crosby, the famous singer of the time, uh, he was his top billed partner of all time, um, you know, because you got that much talent, you know, uh, who do you want to see, you know, all the big names, they eventually get together and make movies, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, uh, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. I mean, there's always those two great talents that you want to see in the same movie together. Well, him and Ben Crosby, they hit it off. They were the Abbott and Costello duo of the time, you know, the Laurel and Hardys, all the Cheech and Chongs, all the great duos of all time. You don't see many great duos anymore. Everybody's going single, I guess. Back then, everybody had respect for each other. Nowadays, there's no respect. Everybody wants to... Well, wants to kind of screw each other, so it's tough to have a partner nowadays. There's not as much respect for the person as there was back in the day. Um, let's say born in England, okay, he was not a United States citizen, so, uh, man, we embraced him, though, I guess. Uh, hosted the Academy Awards a record 19 times, and most comedians would die to do it once, and this guy was invited back 19 times, so, uh. I guess you become a specialist at that point in, in any fee. You know, when you're doing anything 19 times, you're the guy to go to. Which is not easy because you got to follow the guy who did it before you and you're always going to be compared Did you do it better or worse. So it's a risky thing to do because, you know, the, the comparison is there. No matter what you do, you're going to be compared to the person who did it before you. Uh, wrote 14 books. Uh, geez, he's big in the book series there if you wanted to... I mean, back then, uh, people actually read a lot of books. It's not like nowadays where you go to the Internet and catch up on everything. Uh... They actually had to go to the bookstore and buy a paper book and then open up and sit down and read it for a weekend or two. And, uh, let's see, uh, I guess, uh, Thanks for the Memories, the old song, Thanks for the Memories. That became his signature tune throughout his entire career. Uh, he had a brief boxing career in the 1910s, uh, so who knew Bob Hope he started a boxer? There's some things you didn't know. Uh, I remember, who was it, uh... Oh, I can't think of the guy now. Drew Carey. Uh, yeah, he was he was in the Marines. And if you look at Drew Carey, he kind of looks like a nerdy guy. I guess with the glasses, kind of fools you into thinking he's a nerdy guy. Who knew he was like a kick-ass Marine back in his younger days? Well, who knew Bob Hope was a boxer before he became a, a legendary uh, TV star? So, who knows what people do in the younger ages, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, after his brief boxing career in the 1910s, the 1920s, he began in show business. Because there's no business like show business, we all know. Uh, let's see. Uh, he began as a uh, comedian, a dancer, and a bunch of vaudeville shows, uh, which eventually led to Broadway, which, I mean, even nowadays, you're on Broadway, that's the top of the game. But back then, Broadway was the place to be, okay? Uh, probably still top of the world. Back then, it's always been top of the world. I mean, if you're performing, you know, nowadays, it's the big movie. The big movie is the hit. But back then, you know, this is before all the big, uh, you know, 
you know, the live show, you did it live at the movie theater. It wasn't something you showed on film. This was before the big film days. Um, 1934, uh, he began starting to do radio and films. Uh, he was noted for his great comedic timing, timing and uh, his uh, one-liners, rapid fire, which, uh, you know, I've, I've been a guest in some comedy classes where, you know, I go in and I tell comics who are taking the comedy class and want to be a comic that, you know, you don't start out at a big club where there's 300 people and everybody paid 25 bucks to get in. You start out at little bars hoping somebody will listen to your act. And, you know, if you're sitting there talking comedy to a drunk, okay, he didn't pay to come see your act. He could care less. you got to win him over. And he's not going to listen to some big story. It may be the funniest story ever, but he's not going to listen to it. Where the people who paid 25 bucks, they've invested into listening to your story, okay? But starting out, you need to be quick, quick, quick. That's what people are going to get to you. Know, they're going to listen to. That's what you're going to get them to listen to. They're not going to listen. So rapid fire, one-liners, man. That's a great thing to start out with. It gets everybody's attention. It gets them laughing. Now that you got them laughing, they know you're funny. Now they're invested in you. Now they're willing to listen to your story. Where if you start out with a story and you haven't made them laugh yet, they have no investment in the wanting to listen to your story. Uh, timing's everything in comedy. I remember, geez, years ago, what, Fitchburg, Mass. I was at a place with the St. Joseph's Club, and uh, I was telling a jokes about uh, I was a big, big, big guy, but the girls still like me, and as I was telling the joke, I didn't see the club manager was walking up. He had a note he wanted to hand me. Like, in the middle of my set on stage, he's walking on stage, hand me a note, something like, uh, last call for beers or something. And I was saying, these girls come up to me all the time. He tapped me on the shoulder. I was startled. I grabbed the note he handed me. I said, they hand me notes all the time, the girls. I, I made him part of the act, and I got a bigger applause out of that than if I had finished the joke. I had a how it was actually written, you know, because they appreciated my timing, where I didn't even see the guy coming, and split second, I made him a part of the act, so, uh, timing's everything in comedy, great timing, rapid, one line, fire out the jokes, that's what's going to get you noticed, folks, uh, 1941 to 1991, uh, he was part of 57 USO tours, which, uh, I guess he was probably best remembered for that, because, uh, he entertained the active military, and, Back then, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, I bring family courts and all this, but family courts really destroyed family. It's not like you don't sit home on the weekends anymore with the whole family and watch TV. That's what you did on Friday and Saturday nights if you had a family. You sat home, you tuned in the big show that was on Friday, and you watched it as a family. Nowadays, you don't do that anymore. But back then, this was a thing, and whenever there was a Bob Hope USO special on TV, the family sat down and watched the thing. This was big stuff back then. It was must-see television. Uh, he did this so much so in 1997, Congress made him an active uh, honorary veteran of the U.S. Armed Air For uh, Forces. Not Air Force, Armed Forces. Uh, so, hey, I mean, you know, Congress is recognizing you as a, you know, a honorary uh, veteran of the Army, and you never served in the Army. That's, that's saying something right there for how much he gave to the Army doing all those USO tours. So I thought that was a nice gesture. Uh... Numerous NBC TV specials. Uh, he was actually he was the first user of cue cards. So I guess who knew that Bob Hope invented the cue card. So I remember I, I seen a thing on the Golden Girls, and you think you know all these veteran actors they know the lines by heart. They said whenever the Golden Girls were sitting at the table and drinking their coffee, they were always drinking it. They said they wrote their lines inside of the coffee cup when they went to take a sip of the coffee. They were actually reading their lines. That's how they did it. So even the professionals need help. Okay, it's not as you think it's easy, and uh, even the pros have trouble sometimes. They need some cue cards. Now, cue cards are used regularly now, especially on, like, the late-night talk shows and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. I said, age 12, I uh, started earning some pocket money uh, performing in public to solicit money, known as a street performer nowadays. He uh, started out on street cars on the way to the park, so whenever mom or dad was taking their kid over to the park, he'd be on the old street car performing for him on the way over, and... Hey, throw them a few cents, a buck here, a buck there, it adds up, and you got pocket money for the day, and you're doing what you love to do. So, uh, I always thought about doing that, going to the beach and having like a piece of cardboard and just saying, I'll tell you a joke for a dollar. So I tell jokes all day, people give me a dollar, hey, end of the day, I got 25, 30 bucks, I've told a bunch of jokes, I've made people laugh. It's not big money, but hey, it's spending money, and you're doing what you love to do. Uh, let's see, um... After performing on the st uh, streetcars and stuff, he started entering talent contests, uh, one of which he won on his imitation of Charlie Chaplin, who was the big silent film star of the time. And, uh, you know, this is going way back there. This is before TV was even a big thing, okay? So, uh, 
uh, Charlie Chaplin, he was the major silent film, you know, star of the time, and, uh, anybody, you know, imitating him was certainly noticed, uh, he had odd jobs, uh, here's one I didn't know about him, so you want facts you didn't know about this guy, maybe knew, maybe didn't, but, uh, before he was famous, he worked for a power company, and, uh, he was sitting on top of a tree one time, and the tree actually crashed to the ground, smashed his face wide open, he had to have reconstructive surgery on his face, and that was why later on he, he had such a distinctive look, as his, his face was so chiseled, it was because it was all reconstructed. That was how he got his big chiseled face, because of the reconstructive surgery from the accident. Now remember in the Star Wars series, what Mark Hamill, what he said when he did uh, Return of the Jedi, he looked so much different than in Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, because he was in a big car accident, same thing happened to his. His face got crushed, he had all reconstructive surgery, and... He looked a lot different in that movie. Everybody thought, oh, he just got older. Why does he look so different? Well, it was the car crash. And same thing with Bob Hope, I guess. Who knew? Um, I guess uh, during one performance, this was his uh, first big break. Uh, silent film actor Fatty, Fatty Arbuckle saw him. And uh, I guess he was impressed by him. He helped him to uh, get him some work. Uh, started performing in 1925. Uh, he formed uh, with some other... Performers, the Dance Mediums was the name of his group there. Uh, they did uh, some tap dancing and some blackface act, which back then you could do blackface. It was an acceptable thing. Today you would get booed anywhere you go. So that's how culture changes, I guess. Things that were acceptable back then, you can't do there today. He was doing this on the vaudeville circuit, and this was uh, this is where the guys, you know, vaudeville, they went to see the girls, you know dance in skimpy outfits but they couldn't just do that by law you had to have some kind of a show going on so you'd have a comedian next to the girls the people the guys had just come to see the girls at kind of a peep show but by law you had to have an act going on so now you're trying to tell jokes and went over the audience from looking at the girl rather than going to look at you it was kind of a the thing of the time but i guess his friends told him hey bob you know what just being you your personality is so much funnier than doing the tap dancing in the blackface, you should stick, just, just, just stick to being you. So he went back to being you. Um, 1934, uh, he started doing uh, mostly NBC radio, which at the time, radio was bigger than TV. TV wasn't the big thing. It was radio was the place to be, okay? Television was this new thing. It's just going to be a fad. It's going to disappear. It ain't going nowhere. That's what everybody thought at the time, okay? You wanted to be on radio. You didn't want to be on TV. That's where the big stars were, the, the Groucho marks and everybody at the time. But, um, the 1950s, um, he actually did switch to the TV platform because it was starting to become more popular. What they thought was a fad actually started to outbill radio. Every freaking family was getting a TV in their living room right next to the radio. And instead of turning on the radio, they were turning on the TV because you could now watch what was going on instead of just listening to it. Uh, he hosted a bunch of, uh, TV specials. Which uh, had him sign a contract with Educational Pictures of New York for six short films. Uh, you know, you, before you start making big films, you got to make some short films. I did a couple of short films. I did one about uh, Sam Kennison um, from Preacher to Prophet, it's Sam Kennison's story. I did one about a uh, messed up drug addict Santa Claus called uh, A Christmas Story, sort of. Uh, you know, I, I, I was in, uh, what, I was in. Journey the Cartoon Man, it was the third part of a messed up cartoon series, but after I, I figured I had enough, I figured, you know what, it's time to make a first full-length film, which we're doing right now, we're making my first full-length film, uh, The World Needs a New Superhero, in production, so don't forget to catch that one, because hopefully I'll be like Bob Hope and Big someday, because I've, I've paid my dues, it's time, okay, so, but I'm saying this film's either going to launch me in a big time, or I'm local comic Dennis Worth for the rest of my life, but... Even if I'm local comic Dennis Worth, I'm still having fun here on Funny Like Fun Podcast because I love the history of comedy. I love sharing it with you guys, and I thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, so, uh, Bob Bob Hope got a contract for six short films. Uh, 1934, he released Going Spanish, and he said he was not happy with it at all. And, uh, you know, starting out, I did a local television show, and we walked in. They said, you take a class on how to run the equipment, you're off to the races. Do your thing. And... We had no idea. You look at the early episodes, and it's like, we're looking this way. The camera's hitting us this way. We didn't know, but it was a learning process, okay? See, you know, they often say, Aerosmith, the old, the old thing, you need to lose to know how to win. It's the same thing in sports. you got to lose in the playoffs before you can win in the playoffs. you got to learn what it takes to win. So even though he wasn't happy with it, and uh, 
the movie studio actually ended up dropping Bob Hope because they thought it would suck too, but he lost, okay? But he had to lose to know how to win. And uh, the winners win and the quitters quit. So he didn't quit. He kept going. Eventually, he signed on again with Warner Brothers to make uh, uh, Movies Day and Broadway Night. And uh, they started to become semi-hits. Uh, so he moved to Hollywood because Paramount Pictures then signed him to the 1938 film the big broadcast of 1938 with W.C. Fields in it. So he was getting to the point where, hey, we're going to give you a big break here. You're getting uh, to that point. We're going to give you your chance. And uh, I guess it went well enough. Uh, he started to do some uh, road movies. And I guess this is probably to this date, you know, I mean, this was the stuff that broke him into the major time. I mean, he was up and coming Bob Hope to this point. But these series of movies people just loved. Um... He made some road movies with then friend uh, Bing Crosby, as we mentioned earlier. This was the big duo. Uh, they made my favorite brunette, um, Road to Singapore, Road to Zanzibar, Road to Morocco, uh, Road to Utopia, Road to Rio, uh, Road to Bali, and Road to Hong Kong. And these were such a hit. And uh, I guess the movie studio was talking about, you know, after that many movies, you know, that they weren't going to make them anymore. And I guess... The fans just wrote letter after letter. You better not. They were so enamored by these movies, these these characters going on these road trips everywhere. They were actually going to be doing another one. I forget the name of it. And uh, Bing Crosby got sick at the time, and they had to cancel it and shut it down. He ended up passing away, and that was the end of the road series. But that was that was where he made his big name and what he re, all, all the road series of Bing Crosby's where he really became a household name. Bob Hope. After that, it was you know anything this guy did, he had his legend to fall back on. Started working with some of the famous female leads of the time. Um, uh, Dorothy L'Amour, uh, Catherine Hepburn, Paulette Godbert, uh, Hetty Lamar, Lucille Ball, Rosemary Clooney, uh, Jane Russell, uh, Elkie Summer. I mean, just some of the biggest names. And I guess Bob Hope, which if you look at you know, we all remember him as the old Bob Hope on the USO tour. But if you go back to our parents' time, when he was a young man, he was a striking guy. And I guess he was quite the womanizer in his day. And there's something I didn't know about Bob Hope, though. I was studying up for the podcast here. I guess uh, he, he was well known as the ladies' man on the circuit. I mean, you you, you know, you wanted a part in one of his movies. Well, uh, hey, you know, you fool around with Bob Hope, and uh, that might get you somewhere in the, in the business. But that's the way it was back then. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was a common thing back then where, where today, you know... I give you the Bill Cosby of the time today if you did it. Back then it was a common thing, but uh, these ladies, they were willing to do it. I mean, if you're willing to do it, you're willing. If you're not, you walk away, I guess. Some of these ladies, they wanted the part so bad that uh, they got in. Um, and like I said, you know, radio was a big thing. Uh, 1934, that was where you wanted to be was radio. You didn't want to be in TV. He started out uh, the 1934 Woodbury Soap Hour. And uh, that led to the 1937 uh, Pepsodent show starring Bob Hope. And I guess that was so popular, I actually signed a 10-year contract. And um, I guess in the midst of that contract, uh, TV started out Shane Radio. That was the birth of TV right there. He was running for it, so he had to switch over to TV. Uh, known for his TV specials, especially his Christmas specials. You know, Christmas time, everybody wants to gather around. You know, you're in the holiday spirit. The family's there. We're going to watch the Bob Hope Christmas special with all the big stars of the time are coming on these things. And uh, they were a huge hit. He started uh, doing the younger generation, having them on. He'd host the show and have the young stars of the time on. Uh, Olivia Newton-John, Barbara Eden, Brooke Shields, all the young female stars of the time. Well... He was the veteran star, paying back and making them into the big stars of the time. Uh, like I said, uh, he was best known for his USO uh, involvement. Um, and you, you know, this guy's 100 years old. He was in entertainment for over 80 years. I mean, how much was he involved in the USO? Here's all the wars that he did shows for. Uh, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, the Lebanon Civil War, the Iraqi War, Desert Storm, the Persian Gulf War. Uh, lasted over a half a century he entertained our troops and you know most of the times when he was over there entertaining them they had the TV cameras over there and, and they'd film it and they, they'd put them on TV all these specials that he was doing over there entertaining the troops and it became must see TV uh, he headlined 57 times and like I said lasted over a half a century you do anything over a half a century what else is left to be said I don't know uh, 
I mean, that's just the, the greatness of the time when everybody, you know, everybody knows your name, everybody wants to do and you're doing good, you know. I always thought I love doing the benefit shows because I'm helping a lot of people. I've helped a lot of people out, raise some money for some great causes. Makes you feel good. You do what you love to do. I love to do comedy, plus I'm helping people out at the same time. So it's a win-win situation, you know. Bob Hope, you got to entertain the troops. I mean, certainly they're over there fighting every day. They need a break. They need some mental rest. He goes over there. He entertains them, and it's kind of a... It's it's a win win. He gets to do what he loves to do, and and the troops get some much needed entertainment that uh, they wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, let's see. Later appearances. Um, we mentioned the Golden Girls either earlier. He actually appeared on a a guest spot on the Golden Girls series, which I mean, I think that was in the '90s. That was on. That shows he was an old man at that time. But they had a lot of the you know, Tim Conway. I remember was on. They had a lot of their old friends they had on from when they had made it earlier. But that's what you love to see. Now, 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 mentioning all this old stuff, okay, how many times have I mentioned this? He was on an episode of The Simpsons. He was a cartoon character. They paid tribute to Bob Hope. I mean, hats off to The Simpsons, I think. Every podcast I've done, I think whoever we've talked about, The Simpsons in their credit. The Simpsons just gave back to comedy so much. The longest-running cartoon show of all time, beating out the, the Flintstones. The Flintstones was the longest-running cartoon of all time until The Simpsons. I believe, I don't know, if they're still on today. I don't see, maybe they are, I don't know. They've been on forever, I can tell you that much. But, uh, uh, let's see, other than TV, he was known as an avid golfer, and I remember, uh, yeah, you'd always remember the uh, the Bob Hope uh, Classic, which he founded in 1960. He did over 150 charity golf events a year. That's how much he loved golf. Remember, he got his handicap down to a par 4. If you're on a par 4, that's all I mean. The pro pro is a zero. You're, you're only four off of a freaking pro golfer. That's spending some time on the golf course right there. Uh, when he founded the Bob Hope Classic in 1960, in 1995, the opening round, okay, this is how much respect he had from the USO Tours. He was joined on the opening round for a round of golf by then, pre then former presidents Gerald Ford, George Bush, and Bill Clinton. Can you imagine just be out there golfing with three presidents of the United States? I mean, that's respect right there. Hats off when you got that much respect in the business. And I guess... Geez, when you were a kid, I can still remember, you know, it's like you had your 4, 5, and 7 were the major channels, and you had to go to UHF, and then click, 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 and find, like, you know, the old odd channels there, the, the 25s, they weren't the networks they were today, the 38s, and they'd play all the old specials, and I remember watching the old Bob Hope movies, and, you know, for the time, I mean, you couldn't do the stuff on television you can do today, but... You know, the entertainment they brought you, they'd make you laugh in just a silly kind of way, where today it's a hardcore shock kind of comedy. Back then, it was all just silly stuff that made you laugh. And uh, I guess the best one I remember, he was at a bar, and if somebody bought you a drink, if you didn't finish the whole drink, it was insulting to them. So if somebody bought you a drink, you had to finish the whole thing. So somebody said, give us a couple of beers. They come out, and there's like two big kegs they set on the bar. And you had to drink the whole keg of beer, and he was getting tipsy, and he went to stop, and the guy's like, oh, no, 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 I'll finish, I'll finish. He, he's like, I'm going to buy you another beer. He's like, I want a small, small beer. Comes out with a glass inside of like a Kool-Aid pitcher, like when your mom would come out in the summer with all the kids. To, like you had to drink the whole Kool-Aid pitcher of beer, so like a pitcher of beer was considered a small, which... And it makes me laugh today, because when I was in Alaska... I opened up for uh, comedy legend Carl Lebove. God rest his soul. He just passed away this week. Shout out to Carl Lebove, uh, legendary comedian at the time. Sam Kinison's uh, best friend in opening act. But when we were up there in Alaska, okay, now when you get a shot of, a shot of booze around here in Massachusetts, it's a tiny little shot glass, like, you know, a little shot of beer. Well, up there, it's almost like a little cup, okay? Like it's three times a week it's a shot. Alaska, it's like a big shot now. Carl's such a celebrity, he was making his way to the stage. Well, on the way to the stage, everybody wants to have a shot with him. You can't say no to your fans. It's insulting. So he's drinking like a cup of a shot, like one, two, three. By the time he got to the stage, he was halfway wasted. But you can't say no and insult the people. So I guess that, that was uh, making fun of something like that was what I always remember Bob Hope for. It was the big beer scene. That's the one that sticks out of my head from when I was a kid. Uh... Let's see, on his 80th birthday, he was given uh, Kennedy Center honors, and the only people that get Kennedy Center honors, okay, are the biggest legends of the legends. You're not just a legend, you're the legend of the legends. I mean, you're the, the top guy in the field that you do. The number two guy, maybe the greatest, maybe you don't get into the Kennedy Center. I remember uh, I watched the Led Zeppelin Kennedy Center honors, and it was uh, it was really something to behold, and uh, just how they pay tribute. 
Um, some of the, at his 80th birthday at the Kennedy Center, some of the people that showed up, Ronald Reagan, Lucille Ball, George Burns, all paying tribute to this great, great comedian of the time. And, uh, you know, I've heard it from a lot of uh, comedians. They say, if you want to be a great comedian, know the history of comedy. Know what's past, because that's what's going to... That's what's going to make you better, is educating yourself on the subject. Educate yourself on comedy. That's what will make you a better comedian. Uh, sadly, uh, on July 27, 2003, at the age of 100, may we all have such a good life, he died, he died at his home in uh, Toluca Lake, California. Uh, died of pneumonia, which if you catch a cold at 100 years old, it's not a good sign. I mean, that, that, that was it. But what, what a legendary life, I mean, 100 years old. Uh, 80 years in comedy, just uh, 57 USO tours, headline this, headline this, gave so much back. I just, I love the people who give back. I don't like the ones who become big stars and forget where they came from. The ones who become big stars and then they help the next generation up, the Rodney Dangerfields, the people like that, uh, the, the, those are the ones I want to remember right there. Um, let's see, um, I guess he was always uh, remembered for uh, these songs here, uh, D. Lovely, uh, two sleepy people, uh, we're off on the road to Ro Morocco, uh, buttons and bows, I remember that one from a young kid, buttons and bows, uh, blind date, uh, silver bells, the all-time classic, these were some of the songs that he'd sing in his movie while he was either tap dancing or doing his thing or whatever he did, but, uh, a lot of his movies that have a soundtrack and those are the things which, uh, the movie I'm making, The World Needs a New Superhero, a uh, buddy of mine is in the movie with me. He 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 does uh, music too. He sent over the soundtrack for this movie. I, I was belly laughing. I can't wait to release this movie. Have everybody hear it. It's perfect. But uh, hey, hundred years in the business. Uh, I guess uh, his most popular line of all time. I guess it says it best. Hey Bob Hope, thanks for the memory because I mean that was his big song of all time. And if you were a kid and you were watching these shows, I mean this is what passed your weekend. You know. You turn on the old UHF channels, and uh, what am I going to watch this weekend? They're playing reruns of Bob Hope. That's what I'm watching, and, and that's why we got memories of this guy. Playing golf, USO tours, comedy specials, NBC, sitting home with your family, watching this stuff happen. That's what comedy's all about. It's about making people laugh, uh, loving what you do, sharing it with your friends. Uh, you know, uh, give back, man. You know, uh, help people out, do what you love to do. And uh, give relief, I guess, you know, you gave the troops relief, you gave family relief with his Christmas specials and every other specials, you know, you sat home with your family, watched these things, the troops would watch them, uh, comedy, it's relief, that's what it is, because you need relief when you work all day, you need to laugh about something, put something good into your life to take away from the misery, Bob Hope gave us that. Thanks for the memories, this is Funny Like Clown Podcast, I'm your host Dennis Worth, and hopefully I'm giving you some good memories, telling you some stuff about these legendary comedians that, uh, they're doing, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tune us in, man. The numbers are starting to get big. They go up and down. I don't know. I guess depending on the guest if you're interested in that. But I've had some big, big numbers. I've had some small numbers. But every week it's an adventure because I want to see, you know, how big we can take this thing because comedy is where it's at. Tell somebody, people, tell somebody a joke this week and get them laughing. Come on back next week and we'll teach you some more about comedy. See you then, folks. Good night.